Right, this is where we we're up to yesterday. We were talking about the RIP operation. We did actually sort of discuss this at the end. Uh, the RIP operation, or RIP is Raster Image Processor. Essentially what it's doing is it's taking the native artwork file and creating information for the printer. So it's, it's creating um, a bunch of information about what color to put in which place. So essentially, ripping creates very, very big files. So we were talking yesterday about, you know, people were asking questions about what sort of machine they, uh, they should use. The bigger and the faster, the better, because it's got quite a lot of work to do. For example, if you've got a four color printer, your rip will create four separate files for the printer, each of them the same size as the original file. So you'll end up with five times the original file size, the original in four colors. If you've got a six color machine, then obviously it's six times. So you're creating some very, very big files. So those files, um, obviously the, you need to need to be able to operate them and, and send them off to the printer. So a good fast machine is, is going to do a good job. As I also said yesterday, I'm not the expert on all the rips that you're using. I'm familiar with a number of them, but um, essentially what we'll be talking about is things that are common to all the rips rather than specific to any one rip. Um, most of the uh, equipment suppliers will, will be able to provide rip training if you need it as well. Brings us on to media profiles. The media profile, we, some years ago, I used to get a lot of questions from people saying, well, what is a profile? It's not a dumb question because actually, you know, a lot of people don't really understand profiling and what a profile is. Media profile basically is a little bit of um, a, a file that gives the printer information on how best to print the image. So essentially, it works between the RIP and the printer to tell the printer how to print the file. It is made for a specific combination of RIP software, print media, ink type, end use, environmental conditions, and actually the printer itself. So really the best profile is one that has been custom written for you, for your printer, in your print environment, and all those things we talked about yesterday. Essentially, the media profile needs to be written specifically for your machine. However, there are generic profiles out there that will probably do a very good job um, because they'll do a lot of the basics for you. So essentially, what is a color profile? The best analogy would be baking biscuits or baking cookies. If you didn't have a recipe, you wouldn't know what ingredients to use, how much of the ingredients to use, what order to mix them, how, make, how best to make the biscuits, how long to leave them in the oven. Essentially, it's the same thing. The color profile is essentially the recipe. So if you use a recipe to, to mix all the ingredients, and if the recipe changes, or if the oven is set to a different temperature, the cookie, cookies are going to be different. Exactly the same thing happens with a profile. So if you change the profile, or if you make something a little bit different in there, you're going to change the way things come out. So that's why the color profile is so important to give you a good, um, the best way of saying uh, a good chance of getting a really good looking image coming out the other end and that's the profile it is a subjective process and it will reflect the preferences of the creator and what i mean by that is that the person that created it um, depending on how they set the the information in there you can get quite a different profile between something that's going to come out looking like fine art versus a great big pixelated something that you're using for a billboard Similar materials will have similar profiles. So if you've got um, a cast white vinyl, you may end up with similar profiles for other cast white vinyls. Don't expect that the profile is going to work, for example, if you're using something with a different white point. So if you're using a silver film, it will be quite different. If you're using a calendared film with a different colored background, you might get something look looking a bit different. Many people just use a generic profile, and I must admit I'm guilty of that. I often use a generic profile for most of the printing I'm doing. Uh, but don't be afraid to experiment. You might be surprised by what you get. It's not unusual for people to get some, some pretty amazing changes just by mucking around with the profiles. If you're really that keen, get someone to come out and do some profiling for you. It's not something I can do. It needs to be done by someone that really understands your machine and your RIP software. But, but um, Profiles written for you often are going to be better. Brings me on to another subject, and that's color matching. 
Sorry, Michael, just quickly. Um, one of the questions we've got up already is, is it important to delete those big RIP files to clear out computer space? Yes. Um, yep. What I would generally do is, um, if you've got um, a good backup system in place, take those, um, those, those files and store them as a backup somewhere else to free up more, you know, more space on your machine. Huge hard drives are an absolute godsend. You know, multiple terabyte um, SSD drives are an absolute godsend for, you know, for people running RIPs these days because it means you've got much more capacity for some of those big files. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Um, if, you, if you're not going to ever use them again or there's something you're using intermittently, store them as a backup somewhere because it will give you far more flexibility for some of those big files you've got coming through. Don't leave them all on one machine because it'll just slow your machine to a call. Okay, and Mike's asked, um, any particular media you have come across where profile is crucial? Um, well, essentially, if you're using our silver product, you know, the, the, the IJ180-120, you're going to need a profile that, uh, that takes that into account because the white point is so different. It's silver, it's not white. That will need a specific profile. Um, yeah. For a lot of things, generic profiles will work. And as, as I said, I often use the generic profile and it works fine. Okay, and uh, Daryl's asked, will a new profile work better for creating a better depth of white ink? Yes, because it depends very much on your profile. If you've got a profile written with white in there, it's going to make a big difference. Okay, cool. But you will, you will need a specific profile to include a white channel. Great, thank you. Okay. Okay, colour matching. This is a little bit outside, it's a little bit left field, but it is actually quite valid. Um, it is possible to get some color variation across the width of the printer. You might find that um, particularly oranges and things might look a little bit washed out on one side of the print to the other. And that is a printer problem. It's not a, you know, it's not a profiling problem. Uh, and if you take your prints, as you see here from the picture, and if you take this top edge and you put it with this top edge and bring them together, that'll end up there. So this is called topping and tailing. So if you bring these two and put them together, they go there. So every other print, you don't print them all, um, or you don't print them all top to bottom, you print each one reversed. And that will essentially bring the like edges together and gives you a better chance of getting uh, less color changes. It's, it's a little bit esoteric, but it is actually quite important if you, if you do know that you've got some issues with your printer, it's a good way of, of trying to get a better color match. Enough said about that, it is, it is an unusual thing. Brings me on to color management. Ensuring that the color output is correct. You can get all sorts of problems with color management and a lot of the issues that you guys will see are with color management because there are many ways to describe or to define color. You've got many ways to, to create that color. Our perception of color is affected by the environment that we're looking at it and different devices will produce different ranges of color and that's what we're gonna talk about is those things. So firstly, color systems. RGB, red, green, blue, used in cameras, scanners, monitors. It's got a very large color range. It's what we call an additive color. So if you add a red and green and blue together, you get white. So it tends to be used for input devices like cameras and scanners and things. A monitor is an output device, but can also be an input device because what you're looking at on the screen can be used to input into, into your system. So red, green, and blue, used in cameras, scanners, monitors, huge color range, and it creates white by adding itself together. The opposite of that is CMYK, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. Um, K is key, it's called K, and that is the black, it's basically added in a black channel, because if you add cyan, magenta, and yellow together, they're called a subtractive color, and they will subtract from each other to produce black. However, if you've ever seen cyan, magenta, and yellow together, it doesn't create pure black. It creates a lovely muddy brown. So you've got to add in that key channel uh, to give you the black. So you need the extra K, the K channel, or the black channel, to create a pure black. Color range is smaller than RGB, and it's used for output devices. So it's used for all our printers. They all tend to run with CMYK. Brings me on to color perception. Now, if you have a look at that, that's that's typical. Uh, the two blues 
will look different when they're surrounded by black or surrounded by white. That's just purely you're seeing the same color and your brain tells you the color's different by what color surrounds it. And the other classic example of that, I haven't bothered to put it in and maybe I should, and that's that classic Facebook and, um, and um, internet thing that's been going around is, is the dress yellow or is it gold or is it blue or you know, whatever color you want? That is affected by the background and so many people will see it in different ways and that is purely color perception. Brings me on to another one here and that's called cast. If you look at the image on the left, your brain will eventually sort out and subtract cyan from the left and yellow from the right. Then if you change your eyes over and look at the spot on that lady's forehead, she will start to look good. But if you look at that, she is slightly, she's got a slightly cyan hue on the left side and a slightly yellow hue on the right. So essentially by looking at one side, then flicking your eyes to the other, you will see that, that, that she changes slightly. So she will actually look an even color. That's because your brain is subtracting out those colors if you look at, look at the left side for long enough. And we can muck around with images and we can do all sorts of fun things with the image to fool your brain into seeing a different color. So just be aware that cast um, and color perception can have, a, can have a big effect on how you actually see a color. So it brings me on to this slide. Another question there, Steve? Another question. Uh, Adam's asked, on my HP 560, I cannot create an ICC profile when making, uh, making a translucent profile. Is this common with other rips slash printers? That'll be a rip issue. Um, I can't solve that one. That's not really a question that I know how to answer. You'd need to talk to your rip expert, but you will be able to create a profile for it, but I'm, I'm not the one that can do that. There will be someone that can do it. Okay. Um, talk to whoever supplied it. They will be able to create a profile for that. Great, thank you. Okay, lighting and color. Different light sources will produce different colored light. Um, I should put LEDs in there as well. LED will produce a very blue light, but LEDs are programmable. You can actually get different colors of LED. So you can get LEDs that produce quite a yellow cast or LEDs that produce a very blue cast. Um, so essentially what we're saying is different light sources will produce different colored light. What I'm really saying here is check your color under an appropriate light source. And what I mean by that is, is your graphic going outside? If it is, take it outside, check it under natural light. Is it being used un, uh, inside under LED lights? Check it under LED lights. Is it being used under fluorescent lights? Check it under fluorescent lights. It's gonna make a big difference to how your image comes out. If you print something that looks great inside under your fluorescent lights in your, uh, in your uh, print room, it'll look quite different when you take it outside un, under natural light. So check your print under the light source that you're going to be using it under. It brings me on, on to another classic called metamerism. <clears throat> I've actually got a demonstration that I do with this when I'm actually doing this, um, you know, when we're actually doing it live. And I can't do this under um, a webinar. So I've got a bunch of swatches that I can hand out. And essentially what we say is, which of the three swatches, which ones look the same? And they'll say, oh, one and two look the same and three looks different. Then we'll go outside under daylight and suddenly one looks different and two and three look the same. So metamerism is the ability for colors that look similar under one light source to look different under another. So that's why I say match your print under the light source that it will be viewed. So if it's gonna be used outside, take it outside and have a look outside in the daylight. That's the only way to get the color looking correct. And that's called metamerism, the ability of colors to change depending on the light source. Now we're talking about describing color. There are lots of ways to describe color. Back in 1931, um, the French Illumination Society, CIE, created a diagram and that's that one on the left. The CIE 1931 diagram, commonly called the YXY. And what they said was, to measure a color, we'll give it an X and a Y on this diagram, and then the capital Y is the intensity of that color going from zero being black to one being white. So this one comes in and out of the page. So you define your color on the page and then you define your lightness of the color on an on a, a axis coming out of the page. 
So if I'm going one y is yeah, cap y is one is white, cap y is zero is pure black. So you can describe virtually every color on that diagram. They tried again in 1976 to do it again, but no one ever took to it. They just always always use the 1931 diagram. The trouble with that diagram is that it's got a lot of blue and a lot of green, but not a lot of red in it. So in latter years, we've also started to use LAB. So essentially, it's a very similar thing where L is the luminous, uh, the luminosity from zero being black and one being, or 100 being white, and A and B being the color. A very similar idea, but totally different numbers. There are, if you need them, there are out there on the web. If you, you, if you type it in, you can get uh, things that will translate between LAB and YXY. Not unusual for customers to come in and say, I've got a YXY color or I've got an LAB color or more far more commonly i've got a pantone color and we'll talk about more about that in a moment so color gamuts different devices have different color gamuts and the gamuts don't necessarily overlap so if you look at this diagram and you see that outer circle there the outside circle there that's visible light that's everything the human eye can see so everything inside that circle are, are visible light that the human eye can see You've got a lot of colors that you can see in nature that you can't produce. So the next one down is RGB, and that's this yellow one. See this yellow one here. Everything inside that yellow shape is an RGB color. So they're colors that we can produce on the screen or colors that we can photograph um, or colors that we can scan in with a scanner. So that's RGB color. And that color gamut is smaller. So there are colors that we can see in nature that we can't produce on a screen. And the best example of that are fluorescent colors. You can see a fluorescent color, but you can't photograph it, you can't scan it, and you can't print it. So be aware that you cannot reproduce fluorescent colors. You need fluorescent dyes to do that, and it just doesn't happen in our field. The next one down. Pantone, that's the red one. So this red box here is the Pantone colors. Now Pantone's an unusual one. So you've got to be a little bit cautious with this. Pantone is not a color gamut. Pantone is actually a bunch of spot colors. So it's a whole bunch of separate individual colors. So if you actually looked at that in reality, it would be a bunch of small dots rather than that, uh, that shape. It's a bunch of small dots. So if you get two Pantone colors, and you want to go part way in between, you can't. There is no color in between two Pantone colors on the Pantone spectrum. They are separate individual spots of color. And the color gamut is smaller than RGB. And then that blue triangular box in the middle is CMYK. That's what we can print with our printers. See the CMYK box is a heck of a lot smaller than all the others. That's where the issue comes in. We've got colors that we can see, or colors that we can reproduce on our screen, or Pantone colors that we simply cannot hit with CMYK colors. So our CMYK color gamut is smaller. So that, thereby, that's where the problem comes in. We've got colors that customers may want, but we can't reproduce. So what do we do? We go through a thing we call rendering intent. The rendering intent is a way of the RIP software to, to deal with differences in color gamut. It can either ignore it or it can change it. And that strategy we use is called the rendering intent. Different rendering intents will suit different situations or file types. So essentially, there are two rendering intents. The first one's called colorimetric rendering. This is a way of present, uh, attempting to preserve colors that are in gamut. And it works best with limited colors or PMS colors. So you've got an image, your customers come to you saying like, I've got this, uh, this image I want you to reproduce. It's got four colors. So four standard colors, yep, that's fine. One of those colors is out of gamut, one of those colors is in gamut, what do I do? And that's what we've got on here is A and B. So if you see here on the left side, A, A is out of gamut. It's in the, in the RGB space, but it's not in the CMYK space. Yet color B, is in spec, so we can reproduce color B. Now the question is, what do we do to get this thing to work? 
a colorimetric render will look at that file and it will take color A and it will push it just so it's inside the border so we can reproduce it. So it will push from being out of gamut to being in gamut. It only changes A, it doesn't change B. So essentially what we've done is we've changed one of those limited colors. It works great if you've got limited colors, but for heaven's sake, don't try it with a photographic image. What it's doing is it's only changing some of the colors or, or one of the colors to bring it into gamut. Great for limited colors, but essentially, if you've got a large number of colors like a photographic image, you need to do a thing called a perceptual render. This attempts to preserve the range of colors in the file. So we've got the same problem here, where A, get my mouse, A is out of gamut, B is in gamut, but what the perceptual render does is it takes both those and moves them in relation to each other, but it moves both of them. It also moves B. It's moving the one that was in gamut. What it's doing is it's, it's attempting to, uh, to keep the range or it's attempting to keep the relationship between the colors correct. Now, the reason this works with photographic images is that it changes everything. If you attempt to do someone's face with a um, colorimetric render, you would get these rather strange looks. You would get all sorts of strange hues to the file that would make that person's face look very strange. And people are very, very good at seeing human faces. So don't muck around with anything except perceptual render with a human face. Now you're probably saying, well, what the hell's the difference? Where, where do I get a perceptual render and where do I get a colorimetric render? Photoshop does a very good job at it. And strangely enough, your RIP software is doing it. And you just don't even know it. So you go into your RIP software, you probably have somewhere in there the ability to do a perceptual render or a colorimetric render. You can do it further back in Photoshop. Photoshop does it really, really well. So these sort of things, it is a little bit sort of esoteric for many people. They look at it and say, well, it doesn't really affect what I do from day to day. But essentially, trying to get colors into gamut is something you do every day and you probably don't even realize you're doing it in many cases because your software is doing it for you. Your software is making these changes and that's essentially what it's doing. So it brings me on to the rendering intent. Your RIP software is doing it. And there are some quite high-end RIP softwares that will actually do different types of rendering on different parts of the image. So it may get an image where it's got some big block colors and it may do those with one type of rendering intent. And yet inside there, it's got a photographic image and it will do a different rendering intent on the photograph. So it's often doing it in the background when you don't even know. You can get in there and change it have a look in your RIP software or change things around in Photoshop. It will make a big, a big difference to how your images do come out. Brings me on to implementing the color management. Now the true color management controls the entire process from creation of the image through to the output. And really the question is how much uh, control do you have over that process? And you'll find that in your business, you probably only get control over that last little bit. You're given an image and said, recreate it. Some of you will have, um, uh, have guys that sit there doing image creation. You, you'll have these guys that are, are very skilled in this. You may even have people taking the photograph. So you may get control over other parts of that. Graphic design work will control the middle part of that. You may even get, um, you may even have someone taking the photographs as well. If you do, that's great because you've got much more control. But what you'll find is that more often than not, you're brought an image and told to recreate it and you've only got control over that last part. And essentially what we're saying is control over that last part is you will need to deal with rendering intent problems. You'll need to, um, you know, colors that are out of gamut. That's where you've got to do it. You've got to do it at the printer end. So the ultimate goal of color management is to satisfy the customer. You need to understand those cust customers' color expectations and manage them accordingly and agree on a suitable color match. This is critically important. It may not be you if you're the one just running the printer. It may be, the, uh, may be your salesperson or it may be the, the business owner, but you need to satisfy the customer's color requirements.
and those customers uh, color expectations, I would prefer a customer to come in and specifically state, this is the color I want. So how important is color? You get the customer that comes in and says, oh, any dark blue will do. That's gonna be a real problem for you because you'll produce any dark blue and the customer will then say, oh no, that's not quite what I was expecting. Yet if the customer comes in and says, I want Pantone Reflex Blue, that's the only color I want, then you've got a, a target to meet. And that makes your life so much easier because you know what the customer, what color the customer wants. Immediately, you can figure out if there are any fundamental problems. Is the color out of gamut? You, the other thing you need to do is get an example of what the customer wants. You do not want a customer that comes in and says, oh, I want this particular shade. I saw it on my screen. I saw it on the web. I caught, I've taken this color off, off, you know, off the internet. That can bring you a big problem because most people's screens are not color adjusted. So the color that they might be looking at on screen is not actually the color that you'll produce. So if they've seen a particular Pantone color on screen, it may not actually be the color they want. Or that Pantone color may be a shade off from what they want. So try and get an example of what the customer wants so you can deal with, their, well, with the customer's expectations on color. If your customer doesn't actually know, this is a Roland one and I know all the other manufacturers have them as well. So print a color, a color swatch. And if the customer doesn't really know what color they want, flop this out on the bench and say, pick a color. And if they then pick a color from there, your problems are solved because you've produced this color already on your printer, you know you can produce it. So you know, it doesn't hurt to produce these color swatches and have a copy of them. So if your customer doesn't know which color they want, get them to pick one from the colors that you know you can produce. And using something like a color chart like this does solve a lot of problems because you know you can reproduce that color and the customer's picking a color you know you can produce. Agree with the customer on the color match. And if you're using a color proof, have the customer sign it. Because if the customer's signed it, they can't then go back and say, that's not what I wanted. Because you can produce that color er guaranteed every time because you've produced that proof. I don't know how many of you produce color proofs. I know a number of you do, but I can't strongly recommend it enough. Color proof will get you out of all sorts of problems. Your best customer, your friendliest customer is going to be your worst enemy if they think you've done something wrong. But if you've got a proof that was signed by the customer, you've taken all of that out of the equation. You can take that proof out and say, here it is. Here's what it looks like and match it up with what you've produced and say, you signed that this customer, uh, Mr. Customer, you signed this that this color was correct. Now, the other one there is lamination may change the color. Oh, yes. The lamination will change the color. A laminate will change the color to a certain degree. So if you are laminating your print, and you usually will be, you need to make sure that your color proof is laminated as well, because laminate may give it a slight yellow or a slight green tinge, and you may need to change the color to adjust for that. I had one some years ago where the customer produced the print, uh, produced the proof, they didn't have an over laminate on there. The customer signed off on the color and they laminated the print before they gave it back to the customer and the customer said, that's not my color. And it turned out that the laminate was enough of a color change for the customer to realize it and reject it. So I can't stress enough, laminate it because the lamination may change the color. Brings me on changing gear completely, printer maintenance. It is critical for the quality for consistent printer, uh, consistent printing. We talked a little bit about some of those color checks yesterday. Those color checks are part of your printer maintenance. Do them daily, do them weekly, or do them monthly. However often uh, you do them is going to depend very much on how often you use your printer. If it's being used all day, every day, then possibly doing some of those checks every morning when you start up is going to be critical. However, there are a bunch of other regular maintenance things you need to do with your printer. A lot of that regular maintenance, you can get done by a service technician, but most service technicians don't want to do regular maintenance every day. It's boring for them. They'd prefer you did that. So if you don't know how to do the regular maintenance, have a chat to your technician and they will show you how to do a lot of the regular maintenance. 
I know some uh, some guys that do even some of the de more detailed maintenance because they're experienced with it and they can do it. They can change heads. They can do all of that sort of thing because they've been trained how to do it. And that does save a lot of time for a lot of technicians to do the fun and interesting stuff. I can't stress enough using the correct PPE. Um, you want to wear gloves. You want to make sure you're wearing glasses because some of the cleaning solution, you definitely do not want to get it into your eyes and you don't want to get it onto your hands. Uh, getting ink on your hands, while it is an occupational hazard, don't try and do it all the time because getting ink in your hands can be, you know, can lead to all sorts of other issues like dermatitis in the future. The correct tools there also. Use the correct cleaning solution and swabs. So if you are cleaning your printer, make sure that, you, that you've got the correct gear. These, uh, these ones, these images are from uh, my Roland. Uh, so they are a solvent printer. The same thing will apply with um, uh, if you've got a UV printer or a latex printer. So print, cleaning the print heads. Where do I clean? Do I clean along here? Yes, you do. Do I clean along here? Yes, you do. You try and clean around the back of the head. Yes, the head is actually here. Don't clean the face of the head with a cleaning solution or a swab. You can damage the print heads if you clean the face of the print head. If your print head's completely knackered and it's not cleaning, it's not, uh, you can't uh, fix it with a cleaning cycle, then maybe you might want to just try cleaning it with a swab because you've got nothing to lose. But essentially, we don't recommend cleaning the head. There are other ways of cleaning those heads. So don't clean the face of the head. You can see this printer, um, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of magenta. Roland printers tend to be, you know, if, if one of the heads lets go, it's always the magenta. I don't know why, but you know, Roland's are, are notorious for letting go on the magenta head. And I gather from what people say is that um, latex printers, some of the latex printers are renowned for letting go, for the cyan letting go. It's just one of those things, but you know, you will get different colors on different printers. If you're going to end up with a problem, different printers will have different issues. Now with my solvent printer, it's got capping stations. That's these bits here. These capping stations lift up and, and cap over the print head to keep the print head wet. So essentially when the printer is packed, the capping stations are covering the print head to try and stop the ink drying out on the head. So you can see then obviously the, the order of my print heads is, is black, cyan, magenta, and yellow. And these lift up and cover the head. Now these two things here are the wipers. My printer has got two wipers. Some only have one and some may even have four. The wipers are a little rubber thing that wipe across the head. So they'll wipe any residual ink off the heads. Probably the most critical maintenance thing you can do is keeping your wipers clean. If your wiper gets crusted with ink, then it will damage the print heads over time. So you want to keep those clean. Um, some printers, you don't have any ability to, uh, to clean the heads and the wipers do it all. Other printers uh, don't have wipers at all and you must clean the heads manually yourself. All of these printers, it all just depends on your printer itself, which is why I have to keep this fairly generic. But if you've got wipers and capping stations, then make sure that you've cleaned up around there and, and that you don't have any residual ink. So cleaning up the residual ink essentially just keeps things clean. A question. Yeah, Mike's asked, um, if your head is tending to get a continuous buildup of ink around the edges, even immediately after cleaning, does that indicate a problem? Yes, it does. I would look back at, uh, at your cleaning systems. I'd look, check your wipers, check your capping stations. If you can't keep your heads clean, there is something going on. You may have a capping station that's not holding over the head properly and you're getting some ink drying around the head. So this capping station will lift into place and if it's not capping the head properly, you will get some ink drying on the head. So you know, there will be an issue there that, you, that you'll that you need a service tech to look at. Okay, thank you. Common print problems. Potential causes of printing problems are going to either be the way your printer is, its settings, can be the media, and often can be environmental conditions. When you're troubleshooting, try and narrow down the possible causes. 
the best way to narrow down the causes is change one thing at a time. Don't change five things because you'll never know what actually worked. So what I would do is, for example, I, would, I, for, I might change uh, the heat settings. And if that doesn't work, then I'll change it back to where it started. And then I might change something else. So change one thing at a time to try and narrow down the possible causes. I'm not trying to get out of it, but very seldom is media the, uh, the problem. So the, the, the actual print media, the vinyl that you're putting through, very seldom is that the issue. Probably less than 10% of the issues, probably even less than 5% of the issues are caused by the media. It's usually the environment that the print is in or a setting that you've got wrong, something like that will usually fix it. So I'm not trying to get out of it. If it's a media problem, I'll stick my hand up and I'll replace it. Usually it's something else. Banding. We talked about banding before. Normally caused by incorrect media feed calibration. So the amount that the media is feeding forward as it comes out of the machine. Um, it's usually, banding is usually caused by that. It can be a heat setting and it can be a vacuum setting. Sometimes if you've got your heat settings wrong, it can cause banding as well. Not common. The most common cause of banding is media feed calibration. So if you're getting light or dark bands, check the feed calibration. The first thing I would do is check the feed. And often you'll find that you've turned up the vacuum to run, run mesh or something, or you've turned down the vacuum uh, because you're running a, a heavyweight, uh, sorry, you've turned up the vacuum because you're running a heavyweight material. And if you figure out what you've done, then, then often that, the, that you can solve that. The next one is ink spotting. You see the lovely spots of ink here. One here, one in here. Usually caused by dirty print heads. What I've seen a lot of people have problems with ink spotting when they have been so frantically busy that they have simply haven't had time to stop and do a bit of a clean around the machine. The more you use your machine, the more ink will mist around and, and end up um, causing a, a, a buildup inside the machine and then simply dripping out. It's usually caused because you just simply haven't had time to do some cleaning. It could be an environment setting or a printer setting. Uh, but usually caused by dirty print heads because people simply haven't bothered to clean them or they ha haven't had time to clean them. Can't really say haven't bothered because most people do want to do these things, but when the boss is saying you've got 50 million square meters that you've got to print and I need it now, the last thing you're going to do is think about print cleaning your print heads. But that's used, ink spotting is usually caused by dirty print heads. The next one is ink flooding or bleeding. And you can see there that um, the black and the orange have merged in together. You can see along there. Usually, the cause of this is trying to lay down far too much ink. So the ink lay down is far too high. What we would generally say is that for most vinyl medias, an ink lay down um, should be between 220 and 250%, maybe as high as 270, but that's really getting up there. And what we mean by that is that the total percentage of each color of ink added together must not be more than that, 220 to 250. Some media may want to be a little bit less, some may be a little bit higher. So essentially with a four color printer, if you laid down 100% of each of the cyan, the magenta, the yellow and the black, that would be a lay down of 400%. And that would be a, like a soup, you could swim through it. So any lay down that high, will, will, you will get ink flooding or bleeding because you've simply got so much ink on the surface. And that's usually the cause of ink flooding or bleeding is you've got your lay down too high, you're putting down too much ink. Or you've, you're trying to get a more dense image and you're doing a, a multiple overprint where you're putting down several passes, one on top of the other, so you're getting far too much ink laid down. It could be you using the wrong media profile or a bad media profile, and that will generally be, once again, putting down too much ink. It can be an, a, an environmental issue. Um, you're running it too cold and the ink's flowing too much and it's bleeding together. And it can also be media contamination. There's some contamination on the media where the ink is flowing too much on the surface. But the first thing I would look at is the ink lay down. Try and reduce the ink lay down. The next one is media cockling. 
we had a question afterwards about um, trying to print um, short-term vinyls, and they were getting some problems with the uh, with the with the vinyl with head strikes. This essentially is what's happening. This is the first the first instance that you would get you know, an inkling that you'll get there was a, there was a problem. Media cockling, and you can see it's just beginning to wrinkle up there. This usually happens on um, the short-term vinyls or the low-cost vinyls, the cheap ones, the temporary ones. Essentially, monomeric calendared films will do this. It can happen with a polymeric calendared films as well, where you've got a liner that's not that well humidity stabilized. So you've got a cheap paper liner on a short-term vinyl. Essentially, what happens is as the vinyl comes in and the heater starts to heat it up, the heater will expand the moisture in the vinyl, uh, sorry, the moisture in the, in the liner, and it will wrinkle the vinyl. So those wrinkles you see there, or the cockling, is generally caused by a heater issue. Your heat setting may be too high. You're putting too much heat in it too quickly, and it's wrinkling up the film. It is generally what we say with a poor quality media, the cheaper medias will do this. Can also be environmental as well. You're running a very cold media coming through and you're heating it too quickly. That's often the cause of media cockling. Question? A couple of questions, yeah. Uh, John's asked, if using six colors, then what is the ideal lay down percentage? Still 220 to 250, um, maybe a maximum of 270. You've got to limit the colors you use. If you lay down too much ink, it's the solvent soup scenario and you can swim through it. All right. but yeah, it doesn't matter how many colors you've got, you're still, lay, still limited to that ink lay down. Okay. Uh, Mike's asked, we have a Roland RF640, which is quite often all colors come out relatively dry, except red, which comes out very tacky. Is that a common issue? Um, I would look at increasing your temperatures on your outfeed. Um, you just need a bit more drying. That red ink obviously is a bit harder to dry. Uh, it may also be how much ink, how much red are you laying down? Uh, yep. It's it's going to depend on on that. I would, if it is coming out tacky, I would increase the temperature. I know those Rollins, you can you can really can crank the heat up on them. Uh, run it a bit hotter, it might solve that. Okay. And Lisa's asked. So with the three heaters, what one would be that's too hot? Um. In this instance, with the, with the image on the screen at the moment, it's the infeed, it's the heater over the back. It's putting too much heat into it uh, before it reaches the, the machine. Um, in some cases, we, it, it's interesting. We get a lot of people saying, um, do I solve this by, uh, we are, is the solution increasing the heat or decreasing the heat? And I often can't tell you. You may solve the situation by cockling here, by increasing the heat even hotter. So you put so much heat into it, it flattens itself out again. Or you may want to decrease the heat so it doesn't wrinkle it at all. So often people say, oh, I'm getting these problems. I may not be able to have the solution except to say, try altering the heat settings. Which one do I try? I don't know. Try the in-feed, try the platen heater, try the out-feed. Try altering the settings on those because somewhere along the, along the line, you may get it solved. And increasing the heat may solve it decreasing the heat may, may solve it. It's often a bit difficult. Now the next one is a head strike. If your media is cockled so badly that it's striking the head, you'll often get something that looks a little bit like this. And you can see there, I'll just move this out of the way. So you can see what's happened there. This head strike, that's where the vinyl has wrinkled and the head literally has buzzed across it and it's hit those spots as it's gone across. Don't like head strikes. Head strikes are generally dangerous. Um, usually what's happening is you've got a, uh, the head height setting is too low or you've had some media cockling. What I would look to doing is I would alter the height, the height of the head or I'd look at altering the temperature of the printer to try and solve that. Now the next situation from there, I don't have a photograph on, uh, but the next situation from a head strike is a head crash. That's where the head actually catches the vinyl completely and rips it and tears it and jams the head into the media. Everyone thinks, oh my God, a head crash. The end of the world is nigh. Strangely enough, no. A head strike, I would think, is being worse than a head crash. A head crash will stop your printer. It's going to damage your vinyl. It means you've got to start again. Yes, 
but a head crash is less likely to damage the head than a head strike. The head strike, that continual buzzing across, will damage the head. The head crashing into the media and stopping is actually a better thing. None of them are good, but I'd prefer a crash to a strike. The next one is media contamination. You can see those marks there. One there, one there, one there. What those are, fingerprints, guys. Media contamination because you've got the oils from your fingerprints onto the media before you printed it. Usually doesn't cause too many problems, but we do say handle the media with gloves on. I don't know how many people do. It is a recommendation. I'm as guilty as the rest of you. I don't. I get away with it nine times out of 10. But if you've just had fish and chips for lunch and you've got greasy fingers, then that's probably going to cause you all sorts of problems like this photograph. It's usually caused by storage and handling and not using gloves and transferring something onto the media. That media contamination is usually caused by those sort of things. The next one is surface impressions. Surface impressions caused by media storage and handling. You can see the mark in there. Sometimes the surface impression is my problem, so it's actually a vinyl problem. Um, and it's caused by um, when we produce the vinyl in the factory and we wind it up onto a roll and then we put it into a cart and then we ship it halfway across the world through the tropics. If the vinyl has been tightly wound onto the roll and it gets through a very hot environment, one layer can push onto the layer above. So you actually get the vinyl pushing up into the layer above and the layer above the paper liner will give an impression into the soft vinyl underneath. And that's called mottling or surface impression. You won't be able to see it on the roll, but you will see it once you've printed it. So this one that you're seeing in front of you is caused because someone left the roll sitting on the bench for a few days and that got a surface impression into it, but we can get it from the factory. A number of you sign makers may have seen uh, surface impressions in dark colored vinyls. You may sometimes see a loss of gloss or a matte line across a roll of dark brown or blue vinyl. The same thing happens in this, but you won't see it till you've printed it. Unfortunately, there's not much we can do to solve that because if we made the rolls, um, lower tension when we ship them, you would have no end of problems trying to print them because the roll would slip and slide everywhere. You pick the roll up and the core would shoot out of the middle. Steve? Um, anonymous has asked, my roll and bands only in the last 200 millimeters on the left hand side, especially on black prints. Any suggestions I can do to fix this? Hmm. Now that's an odd one. Like it's only banding on one side. Yeah, left hand side on the last 200 mil. Bizarre. I would look at the feed mechanism. That, that may, be, may be a question for your, for your print technician. Um, if it's only happening in the last little bit, it may be something to do with the feed and the way that you know, possibly handling that last little bit. Sorry, yeah. can't, I really can't answer that one. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a service technician question. No, fair enough. And okay. Daryl's asked, um, is there any gloves or anything like that that 3M recommend? Um, we don't sell gloves. I know computer letter do. Um, lint-free gloves, really what you need. You just want something that, uh, that is lint-free. Yeah. Um, I got some gloves from my colleague Chris in Australia that were really great. They were uh, remarkably good for high temperature as well. So uh, for wrapping, they, were, they worked really well, um, but they were also uh, nice and soft for, for handling media. There, yeah. any lint, anything lint-free will do the job. Um, yeah, Darryl, we can definitely help you out with that. We've got plenty. We've got a few gloves on offer, I think, so no yep. worries. Cool. All right, thank you. Okay, so surface impressions can be caused by us, can be caused by you leaving it sitting around on a bench somewhere. Unfortunately, you're not going to see it until it's printed. So this one's a real bugger. You can't do much about it. Now the next one, this one's called lightning strike. This I have seen, this is an image that I took. Uh, this happened from a printer uh, here in New Zealand. This is static discharge. And I did have some questions after yesterday regarding static and static discharge. 
this is a worst case scenario. They call it lightning strike. So essentially what's happened is, as the printer unrolled into this printer, and this was a roll through printer, um, I won't tell you who, it was a Mamaki printer, but that's immaterial, it didn't matter whose printer it was. Um, as the roll unwound, you could hear it crackling as it unwound into the printer. And that crackling essentially left marks that were invisible in the face of the vinyl until the, till the ink went onto it. And when they printed the ink onto it, that's what you got left with. So essentially, it's what we call that static discharge is essentially um, a spark forming as the roll unwound. It was, in a, it, it was on um, a hot, dry summer's day, and that's generally where you'll get it, is, is in hot, dry weather, which is where you'll get far more static buildup. Uh, the solution to this, uh, the, the customer did have the printer on carpet, and I told him to take it off the carpet, that would help. The other solution was you can get some stuff that looks like Christmas tinsel, but it's not. The Christmas tinsel that we're talking here is actually made of copper. So it's a copper tinsel that you can hang from your printer down onto the roll at the back, and it ba basically shorts the roll out onto the printer. And if the printer is correctly earthed, then that will solve your problem. Some of the issues you'll get with static discharges um, are poor earth. So the printer is not correctly earthed. So a printer should always have a three pin plug with an earth pin in it. And that earth pin should be screwed onto the printer housing somewhere. So the roll as it unwinds should be shorted onto the printer housing. That will help to reduce the static discharge on uh, as it unrolls. The question we had yesterday was on a big flatbed. Essentially, possibly the issue there is, as you've unwound the roll onto the, onto the flatbed, you may have built up quite a static charge on there. It is also possible for UV printers to, to um, have quite a lot of static. The UV lamp can create static as well. So you need to make sure that your printer is adequately earthed. The whole thing kind of really comes down to earthing. If you can get that static discharged to the earth, you won't end up with a problem. So with this particular situation that you see there, that essentially is sparking or um, a, that static is, is shooting between the layers as the roll unwound. And that's what's caused that. Essentially, once it does that, you're not gonna be able to print it. If you hear that crackling, you will see this. This, would, this will happen. I've seen it happen a couple of times in my 27 years in the business. So it's not that common, but it is certainly possible on, on dry, hot summer days. So you guys down in Christchurch with a Norwester blowing, your chances of getting a static discharge are much higher on, on those hot Norwest days. And that essentially brings me to the end. So we ran a little bit early on that, which is good. So have we got any more questions? Look at that, you're too good. Um, well, why, if anyone's got any questions, feel free to fire them down below in the Q&A section and, uh, and we can read them out to Michael and, and get that answered. While I've got you, uh, next Wednesday, so April the 22nd, 10 a.m., there is gonna be a, sale, a 3M sales and specifier uh, webinar as well. So what that means is, it's basically an overall grounding of all the different graphics products from 3M and how to select and specify that product. So it's really great for anyone that's working with the films, anyone that's in sales, um, how just if you're the owner of a company and you wanna learn a little bit more, um, it's just a really good all round um, course. That's usually around about 150 bucks, I think, um, 3M Charge, where this is just entirely free. So another awesome thing that they're doing. Um, so yeah, so, um, yes, yeah, so I wanna thank everyone very much for uh, the last couple of days and thank you, Michael, for what you've done. Um, Not a problem. Just, just give everyone a couple, uh, another minute to see if any questions want to come through. Yep. Um, we will have this up on our website as well. So part one's already up. If you need to rewatch it and pick anything up, we'll put part two up. And Michael said he also can make the PDF um, available as well for anyone that needs to um, go back and pull any bits and pieces out. So, um, so we've got a question from Melissa. Uh, can the roller feeds wear out, especially on the outside edges? Yeah, they definitely can. That that it, as your printer gets older, um, those that that feed mechanism will need looking at. 
um, particularly if you've got rubber feed rollers. Um, the, the, the metal knurled rollers don't tend to wear out as much. But the rubber feed rollers will wear out. What you find happens is that they'll tend to, um, as the rubber gets a bit older, it's, it's almost as though it gets like a glaze on it. So I've known some people take a bit of white scotch bright or something like that and rub that over the rubber rollers to try and give, give them a bit more grip. Um, ultimately, they will need to be replaced because that, that rubber will harden over time. We're talking years and a lot of use. Okay. Jane's uh, asked, is surface impressions more common at the end of a roll? Very much so. You're far more likely to get surface impressions in the last meter or two of film. That's because when it came from the factory, that's the bit that's closest to the core and it's got the bulk of the vinyl around it pressing down on it. So if we see problems, it's usually in the last meter or two. Okay, great. Um, I think that might be it. Oh no, here we go, another one, great, oh, a couple more. Um, from Blake, hi, my monometric material, 1500 wide, always crinkles near the end at the same spot where the edges of the 1370 mil roll would feed through. What would cause this? I would say if, if you're talking the, um, the calendar film, it, it's probably going to be a heat issue. Um, <clears throat> You may have some issues with your printer where it's not heating evenly, which is why it's happening in that same spot. I would muck around with the temperatures. Try increasing the temperature. If that doesn't work, try decreasing the temperature. If temperature changes will have a big effect on how that comes out. Okay. Uh, Mike's asked, does 3M have a go-to tool or system for recognizing colors such as handheld color scanners? Um, no, we don't. There certainly are a lot of handheld color scanners out there. Grey Tag make a good number of them. Um, you know, there are good scanners out there. Um, we don't have anything we specifically recommend. We've got ones we use in the labs in the US. I don't have a color scanner in New Zealand at all. If I need any color scanning done, um, I, I will get it done for me overseas. Uh, but there certainly are, you know, it, it's often that sort of thing gets, you know, gets very esoteric and and difficult, yeah, you, you, you need an expert. Okay, great. Um, I, really think, I think that might be it. So I'm just sending my, putting my email in the chat there, guys. So if you, if you think of anything else today or over the weekend, feel free to find me through an email with a question and I'll, make sure, and I'll pass it on to Michael, or you may already have Michael's email anyway. Um, and, and just a quick note, uh, something that I was meant to mention at the start, but just before we kicked off yesterday, Michael got a, a pretty cool phone call literally minutes yeah. before we started literally that, uh, his, his daughter got engaged so uh, yeah. he handled that very well but he, he asked me he goes oh did i did i seem okay and i'm like mate would have noticed any difference so congratulations mate that's awesome news. I, was, I was a bit bit distracted like 10 minutes before we started yesterday my my daughter phoned to say that uh, her partner had just asked her to marry him so it was all very good um they were supposed to be down in christchurch over easter but obviously that didn't happen with lockdown so um, yesterday was the anniversary of them first meeting five odd years ago, and uh, he was got very romantic and you know, made a breakfast and got down on one knee and it was all very romantic and they were both you know, it's delightful. We're very very pleased. That's great. Um, uh, so one more question here: Is the Roland color system chart preset in VersaWorks? Yeah, you'll find it in VersaWorks. It should be in there somewhere. Okay, great. You, all right. For all of your printers, no matter what you've got, there will be a colour chart somewhere that you can print. Um, the HPs have certainly got it, the Mamakis have certainly got it, the Rolands have certainly got it, I'm pretty sure the Epsons have got it. Somewhere you'll find a colour chart, even if you don't use you know, a, a Mamaki colour chart on a Mamaki, you'll still be able to print a colour chart and you'll, you'll have colour charts that you can use. What I'd recommend is print a colour chart for each of the different types of media you use and laminate them with your common laminates. So okay. that way you're getting a good example of the colours. Okay, great. All right, well, that looks like that might be it. So, um, oh, no, no. Oh, just every time I jinx. Uh, yeah. Do you recommend deleting a file from the RIP software library after printing? Yeah, I think you've already answered that earlier on. Yeah, I, I do. Keep, keep, keep a copy of it. Um, you know, like you keep backups of all your files so it means you don't have to rip them again uh, but don't necessarily keep them um, in your rip queue because it will slow your rip down right okay 
Um, and after this is finished, guys, you'll get, actually, you'll get redirected just to a quick survey. If you could take just a minute just to um, fire that out, we'd just love to know how we've done and, and what things you'd like to learn in the future. And, and feel free to email myself with anything that you, you, you might want to learn via this format. Um, it's super easy to do and it doesn't take that much time. And you know, we're, we're really keen to kind of keep this going, especially moving into level three. Uh, fingers crossed, we get, we get some good news on Monday. Um, but this is going to be probably pretty the new norm, I'd say, for for a wee while. And and it, but it's a great way to share knowledge. You know, we've had a few over the last week. We've had over four hundred um, companies attend them. So it's um you know we had a full house today, so it's maxed out at a hundred. So it's um it's really great. So um it's yeah I'm really excited about about this. So yeah, if there's nothing else. Um, I think we'll we'll go from there. So, Danny, we can um, when we send out the survey, we can get you Michael's email as well, so we can send that out to everyone um, for any other questions. Yeah. All well, right, well, Michael. Thanks very much, guys. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great Friday, and uh, and we'll chat next week. Cheers. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Bye, guys.